And this morning we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 19. 1 Samuel chapter 19. Uh, last week we did post the, uh, the sermon only, obviously, on uh, our Facebook page and YouTube. Uh, that was our, <clears throat> I think it was called, uh, a love story with a question mark because of some of the stuff that goes on. And you'll learn, you'll learn more about that as we continue with our, with our series through uh, 1 Samuel. Uh, I do have a, a it's, I don't do anything to make this happen, but YouTube does have a counter on that, and it had something like 50-ish views, I think, as of, uh, at some point in time I looked at it, it around 50 views, so uh, for those of you who are uh, looked into that, I certainly appreciate that. For those who just didn't have the ability or whatever, um, you'll have to go and read up on chapter, the back half of chapter 18 on your own, because we are moving on to, uh, to chapter uh, 19 this morning. And the title of this morning's sermon is Kingly Actions. The Actions of the King. So if you would, let's go ahead and read in our uh, Bibles. We will read the entire chapter this morning. It's going to be a little bit uh, long. Uh, I personally don't have an issue with that because I, I figure if my uh, exposition of the Word is poor, at the minimum you will have left this assembly having read the Word of God. And that's the most important part that we can, that we can cover. Now obviously we ask with, with the Lord's help and the Holy Spirit's leading that that exposition be good. Um, but unfortunately it's somewhat reliant on, on man for that. Uh, whereas the scripture is, is God breathed. So let's read there. 1 Samuel chapter 19, the scripture says, Now Saul spoke to Jonathan his son and to all his servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted greatly in David. So Jonathan told David, saying, My father Saul seeks to kill you. Therefore, please be on your guard until morning, and stay in a secret place and hide. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are, and I will speak with my father about you. Then what I observe, I will tell you. Thus Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul his father, and said to him, Let not the king sin against his servant, because David... Uh, against David, because he has not sinned against you, and because his works have been very good toward you. For he took his life in his hands and killed the Philistine. And the Lord uh, brought about a great deliverance for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood to kill David without a cause? So Saul heeded the voice of Jonathan, and Saul swore, As the Lord lives, he shall not be killed. Then Jonathan called David and jo uh, and Jonathan told him these things. So Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as in times past. And there was war again, and David went out and fought with the Philistines, and struck them with a mighty blow, and they fled from him. Now the distressing spirit of the Lord came upon Saul as he sat in the house with his spear in his hand, and David was playing music with his hand. Then Saul sought to pin David to the wall with the spear, but he slipped away from Saul's presence, and he drove the spear into the wall. So David fled and escaped that night. Saul also sent messengers to David's house to watch him and to kill him in the morning. And Michal, David's wife, said to him, if you, are not, if you do not save your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. So Michal let David down through a window, and he went and fled and escaped. And Michal took an image and laid it in the bed, put a cover of goat's hair from, from, uh, for his head, and covered it with clothes. So when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, He is sick. Then Saul sent messengers back to David, saying, Bring him up to me uh, in the bed, that I may kill him. And when the messenger had come in, there was the image in the bed, and with the cover of goat's hair for his head. Then Saul said to Michal, Why have you deceived me like this? And they sent, uh, and sent my enemy away, so that he has escaped. Now Michal answered Saul, he said to me, let me go, why should I kill you? So David fled and escaped and went to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and stayed in uh, Naoth. So uh, now it was told Saul, saying, take note, David is in uh, Naoth in Ramah. Then Saul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw a group of prophets prophesying, and Samuel standing as a leader over them, the Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. And when Saul was told, he sent other messengers, and they prophesied likewise. Then Saul sent messengers again in the third time, and they prophesied also. 
Then he also went to Ramah and came uh, to the great well that is at Seku. So he asked and said, Where are all Samuel and David? And someone said, Indeed, they are at Naoth and Ramah. So he went there to Naoth and Ramah. Then the Spirit of God was upon him also, and he went on and prophesied until he came to Naoth and Ramah. And he also stripped off his clothes and prophesied before Samuel in like manner, and lay down naked all day and all night. Therefore, they say, is Saul also among the prophets. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you. As we study this scripture, Lord, as it's, uh, as we're taking a pretty good uh, section here with the entire first uh, entire chapter of First uh, Samuel 19. Lord, we just ask that uh, we don't read this as just a story, um, as some sort of histor- uh, history or, or chronology, uh, but God, that we, that we understand that this is your word. And that we understand how it can affect us in our life today. If I understand my pray. Amen. So we, we take a look at this. And again, it was, a, it was an extensive story. We read an entire chapter there uh, just now. And, and uh, obviously you had to endure some of my, my uh, poor usage of the English language occasionally. As I read ahead too fast or too slow or whatever. But the but fact of the matter is. When I first came across this, when I first was studying this and getting our, our series together, I, I kind of read this. I'm like, I'm going to skip to a good part. I was just going to skip this. I was actually going to skip the next two chapters uh, uh, into what I considered you know, a, a quote-unquote good part. But I, 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 as I did some more studying on this, and especially this story, I think, it, I think there are several levels that it should speak to our hearts. Now, the first and foremost... Uh, would be that the, the patience that David has. And we've been talking about this since we started this. This has been our theme for the year, is that we must have patience while we're, while we're waiting for God, but yet we still have an obligation to serve God while we are waiting, that we don't waste that wait. And here we see David, uh, you know, has been already, we talked about this when we first encountered David, that he has already been anointed by God to be king, but Saul is still the king. David's not going to overthrow Saul. In fact, David's going to have to have a lot of frustration in his life as he manipulates or works through this situation. And and we could probably have have stopped right there, but but I really think if we look a little deeper, we'll see some different uh, levels of this story. The first that's going to come about, the first part, there's really essentially four parts of of today's uh, 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 exposition. The first one is how Jonathan helped David again. Remember, we, we, we talked about this great friendship we have between Jonathan and David. How Jonathan loves David as if he loves his own soul. And we talked about that um, several weeks ago, and how, how I, even with my family relationships, it is hard for me to love somebody else more than I love myself. Like, that's very difficult for me, and I would I'd almost say almost impossible. But Jonathan, he loves David. He truly loves David. And in those first seven verses, what you see is, is Saul goes, you know what? I don't like David anymore. Let's kill him. And he tells Jonathan... Uh, I don't know if Saul just doesn't understand the relationship between Jonathan and David. If, uh, I'm not totally sure. I think Saul, I honestly think Saul believes that he's doing Jonathan a favor. Jonathan is next in line to be king. And if even if Saul um, makes it to the end of his life and is still king, he's fairly certain that David's going to take the throne at that time because everyone loves David. And so I think, I think the reason that Saul tells Jonathan this, and we don't get to see it, you know, all, all, all interpreted this way. But, we, but I think Saul's like, Jonathan, dude, we got to get rid of this guy because he's a threat to the kingdom. And Jonathan could have been very selfish and could have said, yeah, Dad, let's do that. He goes, no, I love David. David is my friend. And we have this tremendous sense of honor between Jonathan and David. That Jonathan is going to go to his dad on David's behalf. And this is where the second level of the story in my brain, in my heart, comes out. We have a son of the king. 
who argues for the other person, for David, who is just a, a member of the army, really, uh, on behalf of the son. He argues on his behalf. And the level that I like to take this to is that we have a God. Right? We have, we have God who is the author and creator of the world. He is kingship of all. And we have his son who goes to the king, who goes to his father on our behalf. And just like when we look at, and, and, and for the record, I am in no way, shape, or form comparing our God to King Saul. Not at all. I'm, I'm simply trying to show the relationship between the son uh, arguing to the king, arguing on behalf of a friend to the king. But that's what we have with our, with our relationship with Christ, that, that we, just like David's relationship with Jonathan, David is, is nothing to Jonathan. Jonathan holds all the cars. He's the son of the king. David is a little shepherd boy who had a great victory because God was with him. And, David, and, and, and Jonathan goes, man, I love you so much that I will fight for you for my, uh, with my dad. I will, I will argue on your behalf with my dad. You see, when we, when we study this scripture, this is one of the, one of the first instances, and maybe, maybe not the only, and certainly not the only, maybe not even the first, but we see God's influence on a family, and that we will occasionally, and it doesn't happen all that often in America, and we're very, I'm very happy for that, I'm very happy that our cultural uh, grouping is such that this isn't too usual, but remember what Jesus says is that I have come to cause division. That I'll have father against son, mother against daughter, brother against brother. You know, I, I didn't understand what that meant, that scripture meant. I, I, you know, I read about it or whatever, and, and I honestly thought that I, I had, I had you know, felt that uh, persecution or whatever because, of, you know, obviously when, when I left my, uh, my family's uh, you know, church and the Catholic heritage and that kind of stuff, there was a little bit of frustration there, but it was all very, actually very cordial. It was very uh, uh, nice. It wasn't like, no, I wasn't being stoned or anything. Uh, well, my older brother might have tried to, but I was too quick. But anyway... Uh, <laughs> Although I'm pretty sure that had nothing to do with anything on, on religious grounds. He probably just wanted to beat me at the time. But anyway, that was, honestly, that was as close as I ever got. But see, when I went to college, I got to meet an individual, and I probably told you the story before. But he was an individual, he was a foreign exchange student, he was studying abroad, he was from, um, I don't remember the actual country that he was from, it was either Pakistan, it was somewhere in the Middle East, Pakistan, somewhere like that, a very Muslim uh, country, and while he was studying abroad, he had become a Christian, and he went home for Christmas, and he led his mother to become a Christian in a Muslim land, and when his father found out, he kicked him out, luckily for him, he was able to come back to the U.S. and, and with his student visa or whatever, and he I obviously haven't followed up with him in the last, say, 10 years or so. I don't know whatever happened to him. But, but when Jesus said, I will create father against son, I, like, that is a real situation. You had a Muslim dad who, because his son became a Christian, and, and, and his son was telling me, he's like, yeah, I can be a Christian. I can be open about it because I'm literally like 5,000 miles from my family. It's okay. But my mom can't talk about her faith. My mom can't do that because she is very much under the household and under the rule. And if, if and, and because of the, the, the governmental policies and stuff, where they were from, that, that the dad would, could have reason. This is the reality of, of, of people today. This isn't like, we're not talking this 100 years ago. This isn't 500 years ago. This isn't, you know, Me Too movement in, in the U.S. or anything like that. This is today. There are countries, and this person was in one, where because his, his wife became a Christian, she could be thrown in jail if he chose. So she couldn't talk about it. That's the divisive nature of the cross. Man, we don't understand that. The, we don't get that. Here we see, uh, again, one of the layers that we see here is that Jonathan is going right up against Saul saying, come on, come on, Dad. Man, David didn't do anything to you. He's helped you. Can you imagine going toe-to-toe -to -toe with your own dad on, re on, 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 on the basis of, of, your, of your Christianity? The second portion of this is, 
And so uh, this happens. Jonathan goes to his dad. He, he is able to uh, convince his dad that, man, David's not that bad. And David comes in and he's around him in the form. We don't know how much time takes off uh, here, but verse 8, we know that uh, David goes to war and he does exactly what David's always done. He's become very uh, deft. He's been a very good leader of his men. He goes to war. They, he, he, he again slays the Philistines. He's, he does what he needs to do. Uh, the people flee before him. He comes back. But again, we have a jealous man named Saul who he cannot handle the success of David. So he comes back and we get this distressing spirit again. And when I first read this uh, during some of our some of my, my preparation stuff for this, when I when I read this again, I almost thought, like, man, did I, I I feel like I just read this story like two chapters, and, and it, you really do. It's almost the exact word for word story. He was in he was in uh, Saul's uh, room. He was playing the harp because Saul was having a day. Saul is uh, David's playing the harp while Saul has a spear in his hand, which I just kind of wonder uh, how that would go. Uh, you know, the overall presence of that. But uh, but but finally Saul gets tired of it, picks up the spear, tries to tries to uh, skewer David. David gets out of the way. It says that the, the spear was in the wall. So, so Jonathan saves David. David's own uh, athleticism, his own uh, uh, nimbleness to get out of that situation. He flees that imminent death uh, from Saul. He runs away and he goes to his home. We talked about this, how, how he and uh, Mikael, Mikael loved David, at least at this time, uh, loves David. You're going to read later on when, when things go south on that deal. But um, at this time, she loves him. She's honorable to him. She's faithful to him. And she says, listen, you can't stay here. My dad doesn't like you. My dad is the king, and he is going to kill you. So go and flee. Leave out of this um, Basket. He at least lowers them out of the window. And that's something I think we need to understand with our Christianity. The next level that we need to think about here is that there is a time when we have an obligation to our God to fight. Absolutely. There is a time when we have an absolute obligation to stand up upon the throne, uh, the truth, the word, and to be completely unapologetic. We should always be unapologetic for what the word says. But even Paul, and this is, of course, we're talking about David here, but even Paul, when he is in the first uh, century church, leaving the church, he is lowered out of a window through a basket to, to, to flee, to escape. Sometimes in the church, and this is something that, again, we don't have to deal with in this country. But it's okay. It's okay. Look at the scripture that we that we flee from that imminent danger, that we flee from that imminent danger for the purpose of continuing to expand the kingdom. We're not forsaking the word. We're not changing the, the, the scripture. That we, when I say we're, we're fleeing that imminent danger, we're not going to say, okay, yeah, you're right, the Bible doesn't say this or anything. Like, we're not, we're not, we're, we are in no way compromising the word of God. That is, that is true. That is, we are always going to stand on the truth of the scripture. But, we can flee that danger. And that's what David's doing right here. And David, man, he's, he's out of luck, dude. He can't go home. So he goes to where this all started. He runs all the way back to Samuel. Because, Samuel, you won't believe what's going on. Man, the king's trying to kill me again. He's been trying this forever. And what we see here is that Samuel and David, they, 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 it, it says they prophesied together. We could kind of think of that as like they're praying together. And, and, and this, this part of the story, I think, is, is actually kind of comical. But Saul sends messengers to go get him. Like, right, there's the assassin party going go and take care of business. He goes out there, and, and, and they go to Samuel, and then they start praying with him. And he sends it again, they start praying with him. He sends it the third time, they start praying with him. And finally, Saul himself comes up. And Saul is so overwhelmed by the Spirit, that God's word, the Spirit of God comes over him, that he ends up, uh, uh, as the Scripture says, <laughs> naked, prostrate before him. You know, I really wish, if, if it was a human writing this story, and it wasn't a God-inspired, uh, uh, dedicated, breed story, I really think that if a human was writing the same thing, and then Saul was nice. 
right? And then Saul was wonderful, and then Saul changed his heart, and it was all, we all lived happily ever after, right? And Rapunzel and whatever the Disney princess we want to talk about. At this moment, Saul is overcome because God says, no, 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 David's mine, and you're going to listen. The second Saul leaves, he goes right back into his old self. See, as, I, as we study this and we want to talk about being patient, we want to talk about all these things, I'm like, man, that's pretty cool. But, but here's the reality of it. Saul was the king. And ultimately, Saul didn't want anyone but him to be king. And this is the last layer of this, ser- this morning's sermon. Who is king in your life? See, for Saul, he was king. No one's going to tell Saul what to do. No one's going to tell Saul where he needs to lead. Saul is the man. And guess what? In our hearts today, I think many of us are saying the same thing. I, and, and I speak to myself more than anyone else, but I look at myself and I say, no, no one's going to tell me what to do. I'm the man. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do whatever I want. You see, my, my wife has learned this, this, this trait about me. She has learned that... It, it doesn't matter, and, and she's even she's, she's had to like call my mom or her mom and, and tell them, like, listen, if you want Andrew to do something, don't tell him to do it. <laughs> because unfortunately, my personality is such that if you say, hey, I really wish you would you know, mow the lawn, even if I was going to, I'm like, no, nope, I'm going to do it now. You know, I'm not going to do it just because you told me to do it. Right? That's my personality. That's my human nature. And what we're seeing here is Saul saying, no, no, no. I want to be king. No one's going to be king but me. I'm the best. I'm the whatever. I'm, this is what I'm going to be. And what I'm asking you is in your heart, are you willing to look upon God and say, you know what, God? You are the king in my life. You are the one who's in control of my life. And even if that means i got to give up a, a, this job or move to this location to fulfill your promises, even if I have to do uh, you know, whatever the case is, I have to humble myself, I have to say I'm sorry, I have to do whatever you're dealing with in your life, but for finally look up and tell God, you know what, God, you are king of my life. That you are going to rule it, and I am not. This is, these are the ways that we know God is not king in our life. Here's some examples. When we read the Bible, if we read the Bible, it's probably more, it's more appropriate that when we discuss what we might have read one time in the Bible. But anyway, when we discuss the Bible and we say, you know what? When the Bible was wrote, there was this cultural thing that was going on, and it doesn't apply to us today. When, when this passage was wrote, we don't need to read it the way that it was done this time because today it's different. Because we are in a different world today. Because, and, and when we start taking the scripture and we say, no, 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 that's not true, or this isn't true, or the, this isn't the correct interpretation, or this isn't culturally relevant for today, we are looking at God and saying, you may be the author and creator of the world, but I'm king of my life and you're wrong. That's essentially what we're saying. So if you ever find yourself looking at the scripture and saying, you know what, I don't understand why this doesn't happen. It's a difficult passage. I don't know why God uh, doesn't, doesn't say it's okay to do whatever sin that you're engulfed in. Willfully disobeying the scripture. Now I'm not talking a moral shot here because unfortunately if we're going to go by human morals, those are so screwed up, I don't even know where to start. I'm looking at what the scripture says. And maybe you're saying, oh, well, I've never done that. Okay, well, let's think about that. Have you ever gossiped in the guise of a prayer concern? Or in the guise of trying to help somebody out? And that's a fine line, and as pastors, I have to be very careful of that, because I, I talk to, you know, I'll talk to several different people, and, and they'll, they'll share their burdens and, and whatnot, and i got to be very careful that, that, that I don't go onto the line of gossip. It's just too easy. What about whenever you come off the handle with your anger? What about whenever you see something that makes you mad and instead of responding in love, you want to respond in, I'm going to get even? You see, these are, these are some of the, the, the litmus tests, if you will, of who's the king in your life. What about your act of obedience 
and showing up to be part of the assembly of God on Sunday morning. You see what the scripture tells us in Hebrews chapter 10. It says, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another as much uh, uh, the more you see the day approaching. To not forsake the assembly. Now I understand that things come up on Sunday morning and we got obligations and whatnot. But what I'm asking you is, can you honestly look into your heart and say, you know what, God, you're my king. And because you're my king, I'm going to be disciplined. I'm going to do what the king tells me. Look in your heart. Check your heart. Is your, is your heart tell you, you know what? Two out of three ain't bad. If I can be at church two out of three Sundays, it ain't bad. I will go to church every day, every Sunday, that I don't have another thing going on. Man, I got that new tea time. This is a cool golf course. I got to check that out. The only time was Sunday at 10. Sorry, something better is going on. I'm not going to make it to church. You know, Katie and I, in, 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 in a stroke of our own uh, stupidity, it ended up working out halfway decent. But uh, we had this great idea. Uh, uh, was it two years ago? We bought a camper because I wanted, I was like, man, we're going to buy a camper. We're going to go out on Friday night. We're going to hang out. We're going to go do something on uh, Saturday, and then we're going to come back on Sunday. And I learned very, very quickly that just handling a camper is way more than a one-night deal. And, and, and uh, it just, everything about it was utterly terrible. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not a camper salesman, if you, if you haven't noticed. But, um, and, and finally, I looked at Kate, and I said, man, Kate, this would be so much more fun if I wasn't a pastor. If I could take the whole weekend. Now, get, don't get me wrong. If, if you're out traveling or whatever... Man, that's awesome. If you've got if you've got a you know some sort of athletic event that takes you off to Kansas City and you got to be there at uh, you know Sunday at, at noon or whatever, that's great. I encourage you find an assembly that you can go be part of Sunday morning. He's still king of your life. Just allow him his time. Allow him that Sunday Sabbath. Say, you know what, God, I'm going to go. I'm going to follow. I was talking to an old pastor. He was um, was really all that old. He was in his sixties. He had retired. And he goes, this has been amazing. And so I'm not, I'm just, I'm not that old. So on, on Wednesday nights, uh, you know, we'll, we'll come to choir practice if we have it. But, you know, if, if something's going on, we may miss it. We may, uh, you know, choir practice is, is certainly far more uh, kind of hit or miss uh, for us. If anything else is going on, it happens. Uh, if, 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 you know, if, for instance, there's a basketball game, a sectional game, something like that going on, we want to go check in, we'll, we'll watch that, we'll do whatever. He goes, yeah, it's, it's been amazing. I have watched he's old enough that he goes, I've watched us stop coming on Wednesday nights all the way through to not even showing up on Sunday mornings. He goes, when I was a kid, and his dad was a pastor, he was in St. Louis, he played baseball in St. Louis, he was a phenomenal baseball player by his own account. He made it to an all-star game in St. Louis. Uh, it, was, it was like a peewee, uh, junior Babe Ruth level uh, all-star game. They got to play the all-star game at Bush Stadium Field at, at the, where the St. Louis Cardinals play baseball. I mean, huge, exciting, right? The game was going to be on Wednesday. And his dad said, you aren't going. You're going to church. Man, as a sportsman, I'm like, dude, your dad sucked. <laughs> you know? But that was the level of, 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 of approach that they took Wednesday night prayer meeting. And now we come all the way down to where a lot of praise. We don't even have Wednesday night. We don't even have Sunday night because it's just too hard. And we come into church on Sunday morning. We say, you know what, God, you can be king of my life anytime I don't have something else going on. But you can be king of my life anytime that I'm just not too tired or I didn't stay up too late or the weather's not too bad or whatever. Guys, I'm asking you, and this isn't, this isn't a, a beat, beat each other up because you do or don't come to church. That's not, that's not the goal here. The goal is to look into your heart and really honestly ask yourself, is Jesus my king? Am I changing the Bible because it's what I needed to fit my life? Am I taking my cultural impressions and applying them to the scripture as opposed to taking my, my scripture knowledge, and maybe we need to read that more, and, and applying it to what my, my life is? Guys, I can't answer that question, who's your king? But what I can tell you is that what we've learned in this chapter is Saul is so desperate to be king that he is making ridiculous decisions. And you know what? Those decisions are mirrored in our life each and every day. If we're not willing 
to let Jesus be our king, to truly give him the control. Our closing song is number 217.